Uh, we're still going to stay on the topic of uh, trials. Last week we talked about trials, and we're going to get into that in just a little bit, but uh, I kind of want to start us off by talking about a very important attribute for people you probably look up to. If I think about people that I look up to in my life, one of the main attributes of their lives is perseverance, right? We love to watch movies, real life stories of people who go through hardships, people who continue to battle and battle and battle and they persevere. They don't give up, right? They're just feel good stories. And if you think about people that you admire in your own life right now, I guarantee you one of their attributes that you most admire is the fact that they just don't give up. They continue to push and push and push no matter what is thrown their way. And uh, sometimes those people, most of the time those people have a strength that's so rare in a world full of people who just wave the white flag and surrender. And American history is actually full of these men and women. If, you're, if you like American history, then you know of men and women throughout the, the, the time the United States has been in the existence that they continue to push on and they persevere, and even in world history. But I saw a poster online this week. Um, it was actually in a frame. I guess I could have ordered the frame with it. Uh, I didn't even order the poster, to be honest with you. But I'm going to read some things about this person on the poster, and I want to see if you can guess who I'm talking about. In 1831, he failed in business. And so already you're thinking about the years. In 1832, he was defeated for state legislature. In 1833, he tried another business. It failed. In 1835, his fiance died. In 1836, he had a nervous breakdown. In 1843, he ran for Congress and he was defeated. He tried again in 1848 and was defeated again. He tried running for the Senate in 1855. He lost. This is, this is sounding bad, isn't it? <laughs> it's like, oh, this guy. The next year, he ran for vice president and lost. In 1859, he ran for the Senate again and was defeated. In 1860, the man who signed his name as A. Lincoln was elected the 16th president of the United States. Did y'all know who I was talking about when I started giving that? That's pretty incredible, right? Abraham Lincoln, one of the most well-known presidents of the United States, the man who uh, almost single-handedly abolished slavery, failed and failed and failed and failed and never gave up became the 16th president of the United States. He persevered despite difficult trials in his life. So today, we're going to focus on perseverance, but of a different kind. We're not going to focus on just never giving up in your life. We're going to focus on perseverance in Christ. And so it, this isn't the same as when I'm out in the driveway and I'm trying to replace a power window motor in, in a car. And if you've ever tried doing that, I would never wish that on my worst enemy, okay? Your hands won't fit in the holes inside the car door, and you will drop a screw in there that you'll never get back. I promise you, and after hour after hour after hour of saying things in your head that you would not repeat in public, you finally get it installed. That's, that's just persistence, y'all. That's not perseverance. That's not what we're talking about here. That's just persistence. This morning... James has even more encouragement for the scattered, persecuted church. This morning, he has even more encouragement for us. He encourages us to persevere in Christ, to press on in Christ, to run the race set before you no matter what comes your way. To lean in on him when it feels like you can't go on anymore in your Christian walk. So with that, please stand for the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. This is James chapter 1, verses 9 through 18. Let the brother of humble circumstances boast in his exaltation, but let the rich boast in his humiliation, because he will pass away like a flower of the field. 
For the sun rises and together with the scorching wind dries up the grass. Its flower falls off and its beautiful appearance perishes. In the same way, the rich person will wither away while pursuing his activity. Blessed is the one who endures trials because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. No one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God since God is not tempted by evil and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights who does not change like shifting shadows. By his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. So by the end of the sermon today, my prayer is that we all are able to take away what Christ honoring perseverance looks like in our lives, okay? What pressing on in Christ looks like in our lives. And I want you to recall last week that this perseverance, or as the CSB calls it, this endurance that we get in our lives comes from God sovereignly ordaining trials in your life in order to increase your endurance or your perseverance to run the race he set before you to make you mature and complete Christian so that at the end of your race, you are lacking nothing as a follower of Christ. And James also recalled Uh, If you'll recall, James also encouraged us last week that in the midst of your trials, you were to count it not just joy, not just joy, great joy. That's that's counterintuitive, y'all. In in our society today, we face something hard. Our gut reaction is to get upset and to grumble. James is saying, no, 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 you got it wrong. When you face a trial in your life, your gut reaction should be to praise God and say, you know what, thank you, God, that you love me this much, that you are putting this in my life. I'm counting it as great joy. What we have to realize, church, I'm just reminding you from last week, is God is using the trials in your life for your good and for his glory, that he is doing something. He's doing something. God isn't a lazy God. He's not just hanging out up there in a a godly lazy boy, just hanging out. He doesn't do that. He is doing something in your life right now through the trials that you're going through. And in our text today, James fleshes out how we are to not only persevere in those trials, but how our perseverance in and through Christ will help us to avoid temptation And how our perseverance in and through trials should lead us to fixing our eyes and our lives on God's faithfulness. And so let's jump into our text. We're going to go over verses 9 through 12 to begin with. James writes, let the brother of humble circumstances boast in his exaltation, but let the rich boast in his humiliation because he will pass away like the flower of the field. For the sun rises and together with the scorching wind dries up the grass. Its flower falls off and its beautiful appearance perishes. In the same way, the rich person will wither away while pursuing his activity. Blessed is the one who endures trials. Because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Now what we have to remember with this church is if we read this out of context then we're going to feel like James just jumps around. He tells me to persevere in trials here, that God is putting trials in my life to test my faith, to increase my endurance, to make me a more mature, complete Christian, so at the end of my race, I'm lacking nothing. 
But now he jumps to rich and poor, and then he goes back to blessed is the one who endures trials. It doesn't make sense. Why is James even talking about rich and poor here? But we need to remember that he's writing to the scattered, persecuted church. And that there are people in the church, just like in our church, just like in any church, who are struggling financially and who are well off financially. His concern is that everyone, no matter what's in your bank account, that you are focused on Christ. That you are living a life that is eternally focused. And so that's his goal, to fix our eyes heavenward to have an eternal perspective. And so he starts talking about the poor Christian. He's encouraging the poor Christian. These, these are the Christians that are struggling for food, for clothing, for shelter. These are Christians who are struggling to make ends meet. James calls them to boast in their exaltation. What does that mean? Boast in your exaltation. When everything in your life is just directing you to just focus on the bad, he says, focus on this one thing, that God had mercy on you through Jesus Christ. Focus on this one thing, that right now, if you are a follower of Christ, you have a restored relationship with the Father. Focus on this one thing, that, that right now, if you are a follower of Christ, you are in right standing with God Almighty. Your bank account doesn't matter if you're focusing on that. There's things that are way more important than the material things of this world. He says, focus on this right now. Yes, you are going through horrible times. Yes, you have trials in your life that are just bad. But eternity awaits. Your life on this earth is but a vapor. Eternity is forever. And it's waiting for you. Focus on that. Rejoice in that. Count that as joy. It's the same thing that Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Let me share this with you. And, and there's really about six verses before this that are equally as important and lead you into this. But Paul writes, therefore, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We need to change our perspective, church. We need to change our perspective. No matter what pain we may endure now while on, on this earth as a result of the fall, Christ's work on the cross is, is changing you daily. He bought your salvation, but he's not leaving you where you are. Every day he's working on you to make you look more like him. He set you free from the chains of sin. And if you were a Christian, you were once a slave to sin, but now... You have a restored relationship with the Father forever. That forever is so important. You need to dwell in the fact that you were bought and you were purchased forever. Enduring the pain and heartache and persevering in Christ's work in and through you is worth it. Every moment is worth it. Eternity awaits forever with the Father and the Son awaits. And if we keep that perspective, if we constantly focus on eternity, focus on what he's done for us through his Son on the cross, then we can rejoice in our exaltation. But now James talks about the rich. And church, let's be honest. Our measure of wealth and the measure of wealth in the early church is completely different. 
the fact that we have homes to stay in, a lot of people around the world don't. The fact that you probably ate a meal this morning, many people around the world don't. And so here, I'd like to think James is really talking to us. In verses 10 and 11, James encourages the church and believers worldwide to gaze on the beauty of Christ instead of things that we tend to turn to like money and material objects. You see, we use these things in our lives. You know, I, I, have, I have a device right there in that pew. It's an iPhone that I tend to turn to to self-medicate when things get bad. We have iPads and computers and we have hobbies. We have all these things that we tend to turn to that kind of redirect our focus and take our time so that we don't have to think about the trials in our lives. And James is calling us right now to focus on the beauty of Christ and the salvation that he purchased for us in the midst of trials. James is telling us that our wealth means nothing at the end of our race. At the end of our race, our cars mean nothing. At the end of our race, our houses mean nothing. At the end of our race, my iPhone means nothing. It will all perish. All of it. It will all perish like a beautiful flowering plant in a scorching wind. What lasts is if we are children of God or not through Christ. What lasts is the freedom Christ bought for us and that we, in our brokenness, ran to him to receive. What lasts is when we declare Christ is Lord in our lives. That's what lasts. And then James moves on to a very Sermon on the Mount type statement. Considering he's the brother of Jesus, it's kind of interesting. Um, he says, blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So not only is God molding us, mold, molding us and making us into a Christ-like disciple daily, but at the end of our race, we'll receive the crown of life for all we've endured. Now, I, I don't want you to think that we're just going to get this huge golden crown with all these jewels that we just want a, a blinged out crown, right? Just lots of things on our crown. That's not, the readers during his time would not have thought that at all. I don't know if you've ever seen paintings of uh, ancient Greek Olympics and the, and the victors wearing kind of the, the, the laurel crown, the plant kind of woven together crown on their heads. That's what James's readers would have seen in this. Very basic. Not gaudy at all. But it's a symbol of running a good race and finishing well. And James says, at the end of our race, we'll receive the crown of life for all we've endured. It's a recognition for the way that we endure trials and that at the end of our race, remember he says we're going to lack nothing. God is unchanging, never failing, always good, always trustworthy, and he's promised eternity to everyone who is saved. And so what we need to remember, church, is that he's keeping your salvation and my salvation in the grip of his hand, and no one is going to be able to snatch it from him. No one. He then moves on to encourage the brothers and sisters to persevere in guarding against temptation. So we're still talking about trials, but now we move to temptation. And what's kind of interesting is that sometimes we get the two things confused, trials, temptation, right? A difficult trial means temptation. And what James is doing is he's separating the two. Now it is true that in every trial you face, you will face temptation. Every trial. But it's about where you put your focus in the midst of the trial. That's what's important. We're going to flesh that out in just a minute. Every trial comes with its own 
Satan-initiated, man-centered temptation that believers must be on guard against. James writes in verse, starting with verse 13, no one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God, since God is not tempted by evil and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. So we got to remember, church, that James has already called the lowly and the rich to boast in their status before the Lord as Christ's followers. He's called us all to fix our eyes on Christ. But here he makes a distinction between trials and temptation. Trials lead to becoming more mature, complete Christians. Temptation leads to death. And so we have to begin where James began. He says that God is not the one who tempts us. He doesn't. Why would a good and loving and righteous God tempt us to death when he wants to give us abundant life? Doesn't make sense. But the enemy wants to tempt us. The enemy wants us to have death. If temptation leads to death, God wants us to have the exact opposite. And, and James even says, God is not tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So what happens when we're tempted, church, is in the midst of a trial, when we focus not on God, and remember, not on God saying that this is a testing of your faith to produce endurance, to make you more mature and complete, to, so that at the end of your race you're lacking nothing, our reaction isn't joy in the trial. If we start to dwell in how horrible a trial can be, then our focus turns to the lowercase g God that we served before we were saved. And that's ourselves. That's ourselves. And in the midst of a trial, if we turn toward ourselves instead of toward God, then we automatically are falling to temptation. God wants us to have life. The enemy wants us to have death. And once we turn toward ourselves, we start to desire what we shouldn't have. So let me give you a couple of examples. If our finances are failing, when we don't choose to turn to God and his providence, and we start to chase after money, then we succumb to temptation. Better yet, if you're struggling in your finances and you turn to getting money, and we see it in the news all the time about people embezzling, and you start to steal money because you want it, because you're struggling in that area, temptations become sin. Or when we're struggling in our jobs instead of trusting in God as our only source of encouragement, we look to work our way up the ladder so that we can receive the praise of people around us. Do you see how a trial, when we shift our focus to ourselves, can become temptation? It's no longer Christ honoring, it's self honoring. When we shift our focus from God to ourselves during any difficulty, temptation takes root. And the enemy uses that temptation to stir up desires in us, according to James, to get what we want. And after we've dwelled on that desire over and over and over again, then we sin. And church, before Christ, that sin was sure death. Before Christ, we were dead men and women walking, but praise God that he made a way through Jesus Christ. Praise God that before the very foundations of the world, that, that God made a plan to, send, to save a sinful people by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to be born sinless, to live a sinless life, to die a sinner's death, to go up to Calvary, to hang from a cross, and I just envision this constantly, to be hanging from the cross and him calling to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God pouring his wrath that I deserve and that you deserve on his son. So that by faith in Jesus Christ, 
he has paid the penalty that we deserve. And by being buried and raised on the third day, our Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, our King is seated at the right hand of God right now. We serve a Jesus who is alive right now. We serve a Christ, a King, a Lord who gave it all for us right now. And so church, what we need to understand is that we have the power living within us right now to turn from things like temptation. In the midst of every trial that we ever face, we have a power inside of us right now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, known as the Holy Spirit, that we're able to count it all great joy that we're going through a trial. We have the power within us right now, church, to turn from grumbling about what we don't like to turn from to praise to a God that we adore. Finally, church, James encourages brothers and sisters in Christ to persevere in God's faithfulness. Let's read the last couple verses. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. By his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. James calls us, church, to continue to trust in God's faithfulness in the midst of trials. And to be honest with you, church, it's just like riding a bike. I think everybody in here has learned to ride a bike. If you haven't, and you're an adult, let's, let's work that out in the parking lot. Like, I'll bring a bike. We'll, we'll have some fun. This will be great, all right? Everybody in here has learned how to ride a bike. And you'll remember when you learned how to ride a bike, this is what happened. Once you got those training wheels off, because let's, let's be honest, if you're riding with training wheels right now, you're really not riding a bike, right? You get those training wheels off, and there's somebody behind you holding the seat, right? And you're on two wheels, and you're pedaling, and you're pedaling, trying to pedal faster so you can stay up. And eventually, that person lets go of the seat, and you just pedal and pedal and pedal. And if you're like me, the first time I learned how to ride a bike, I hit a hill and I fell over. Because I learned how to pedal, but I didn't learn how to stop and put my feet down. Right? The first time. But then, you get up, you get back on the bike, and you pedal, and you pedal, and you pedal, and you pedal, and you stay up longer. You might fall. But you're not scared that, that the bike can't hold you. Over time, you become less and less and less afraid that you're going to be able to stay up at all. And now, I can get on any bike, and all of you can probably get on any bike, and you know that once you start pedaling, you're going to stay up. You don't even think about falling over anymore, right? James is telling us to trust God during the midst of whatever trial is going on in your life right now. Whatever trial is going on in your life right now, to trust God. To trust that it's a God-given, good, and perfect gift from Him. To test your faith, to produce perseverance, to make you a more mature, complete Christian so at the end of your race you're lacking nothing. To count it all as great joy... And the more you trust him in the midst of this trial, and that you can count it all as great joy in the midst of this trial, when you get to your next trial, you can trust him a little bit more. You'll count it all as great joy a little quicker, just like riding a bike. So that after time and time and time and time again of trusting and seeing God come through and trusting and seeing God hold you up and, and trusting and seeing God having you in the palm of his hands, eventually, church, every single one of us, as soon as a trial comes, our gut reaction will be to count it as great joy. James describes God as the father of lights, and that's just another way of saying that God is our creator. He's our creator and our sustainer. And he wants you to dwell on that. If God created you, 
He's going to hold you. If God created you, he's going to keep you going. If God created you, he loves you. God knit us together in our mother's wombs. He feeds us, he clothes us, he watches after us with his provision. Through his grace, we've been offered eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. By his mercy, by faith in Christ, he spared us his wrath and poured it out on his son instead. God, God loves us. Church, God is for us and not against us. He provides for us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And because of that, church, we can fully rest on all of his attributes that we read in Scripture. Because, as James says, he does not change like shifting shadows. What he says about himself will be true today, tomorrow, and every day after to and through eternity. Trust it, church. Trust it. He reminds us in verse 18 that no matter the trial, we have to remember that God's goodness is not dependent on our perfection. Newsflash, church. None of us are perfect. But we are all broken. And I don't care where you come from. We're all equally broken. If the new covenant through Jesus Christ depended on us, we would be dead in our tracks. This life would be meaningless because we'd have no hope for a future. But, God, but James tells us that the gift of salvation is God's choice. Rest in that. He is perfect, he's righteous, and he chose to offer salvation to those who would accept it. He chose I'm glad that it doesn't rest on me. He won't go back on what he says. He chose to give us a new birth through faith in Jesus Christ. And because he's steadfast and because he is unchanging, he desires for us to have a sort of relationship with him. Every brother and sister in Christ, both past, present, and future, has a secure salvation. Secured by and through him. Better yet, James refers to us as the first fruits. Now, what this term first fruits means, it's a, it's a Hebrew term that, uh, that you see in Old Testament scripture that literally means promise to come. And what James is saying here is that the church, believers past, present, and future, the church is the preview for the new earth that awaits after Jesus' return and his final judgment. The church, we got to understand, is people from all walks of life, all socioeconomic levels, different home lives, different talents, different gifts, all unified under the banner of Christ, all passionate about telling people about the gospel, all loving one another with a love that can only come from the Holy Spirit, all being patient with each other, all submitting to Christ as Lord, all trusting in God's goodness all growing in endurance and maturity through trials, all running to our good, good God, all resisting temptation, and all boasting in the salvation of the sinner, so that Christ is declared Lord in all the world, and so that we are forever thankful in his work in us. Church, persevere in living out your redemption in Christ Jesus. Persevere in seeing God's goodness in the midst of trials so that you don't fall into temptation. Persevere in dwelling in God's faithfulness for your life. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, this was our scripture reading at the beginning of service. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do... Forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. One day, every believer will be in the presence of a holy, almighty, and righteous God. 
One day, every believer will see the risen King Jesus seated on his throne. One day, there will be no more tears. One day, there will be no more pain. One day, there will be no more temptation. One day, there will be no more heartache. One day, there will be no more sin. One day, there will be no more trials that we have to go through, church. But until then, until your race is finished, and until my race is finished, persevere, endure, know that God is at work even when we don't see it. Know that God will continue to work in you and through you. Consider it all great joy, my brothers and sisters, when you endure trials. Remember, church, every good and perfect gift is from above. And that includes the trials in your life. Remember, church, that God is using the gifts to guide our eyes to look forward to the day when we are complete, when we're lacking nothing, when we receive the crown of life. Endure, church. Persevere. Let's pray. Our good and loving righteous God. God, we humbly come before you this morning submitting our lives to you. God, for every believer that's in this room and watching online this morning, God, I pray that they would give you all of what they have. God, that they would place their lives fully in the palm of your hands and that they would trust that in you and through you, their salvation through Christ is secure. And God, I pray that we would all remember that so that in the midst of trials, that we would endure, that we would press on, that we would praise you and count it all as great joy that, that you are molding us and making us into more mature, complete disciples of you. God, I pray that for anyone in this room and, and watching online this morning, if they don't have a personal saving relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that you would break hearts, that you would direct eyes toward you, that you would help those people to see that they are lost and that they are broken, and that there's no way to have a restored relationship with you, no way to be able to navigate through the difficulties of life without having a relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray that they would confess Christ as Lord and Savior, that they would believe in their hearts that you raised him from the dead, so that in that moment they would be saved from then and forever. God, I pray that you would constantly keep our focus on the salvation that you have freely given us. God, I pray that when things don't go our way in the church, that things don't go our way in our homes, that things don't go our way in our workplaces, that we would remember that our one and only goal is to share Christ with others and to glorify you. May that be what we always chase after. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.